fantastico, fantastico, grazie, grazie di essere qui. Ringraziamo la CIL della Coalizione Italiana Libertà e Diritti Civili per questa grande occasione e di questo confronto che avremo questa sera. Ben Weisner, l'avvocato di Snowden, eh, Patrizio Gonnella, il presidente CILD, Andrea Menapace, il direttore CILD, Simon Davis, il cofondatore di Coread. E siamo stracontenti di avere qui Edward Snowden e Laura Poitras. The English version, uh, we welcome Edward Snowden and Laura Poitras. Thanks to SHIELD, uh, which you see written on the banners to the side, and the American Civil Liberties uh, Union, represented by Snowden's lawyer, Ben Wisner, here present. Enjoy the evening. Thanks very much. Sì, grazie a tutti, scusate l'attesa, ma insomma forse ne valeva la pena, non vi tolgo praticamente niente di tempo, io sono il presidente di questa nuova grande organizzazione italiana che speriamo occupi uno spazio, uno spazio si chiama, la coaliz si chiama Coalizione Italiana per i diritti e le libertà civili, sostenuta da Oak Foundation e soprattutto da Open Society Foundations, eh, siamo 30 organizzazioni, 30 organizzazioni cerchiamo di occupare uno spazio, quello delle libertà civili che è uno spazio di dibattito pubblico, politico, che in Italia è uno spazio diciamo, poco, poco vissuto, ci occupiamo di tutto, ci occupiamo di grandi questioni, grandi questioni di grande attualità, dalle migrazioni alla giustizia, alle droghe, alla, alla, alla grande questione carcere, alla questione, alla questione Roma e ci occupiamo anche di privacy ci occupiamo anche di privacy perché siamo certi che eh, è un diritto fondamentale, interconnesso agli altri diritti, non è qualcosa che riguarda i salotti, la privacy è qualcosa che riguarda tutti noi ed in particolare qui per chiudere in questo minuto riguarda noi, noi attivisti dei diritti umani perché noi attivisti dei diritti umani più degli altri siamo soggetti a controllo, a sorveglianza e questo controllo e sorveglianza che mettono a volte in tanti paesi a rischio le vite, questo non accade ovviamente in Italia però in in Italia lo spazio pubblico per gli attivisti dei diritti umani è molto, è molto ridotto. Per questo ringraziamo il Festival del Giornalismo per averci dato questo spazio. Wow. Ok, so um, I speak English, so uh, if I think it's okay. Uh, uh, just a brief recap for those who lived on Mars in the last couple of years. Uh, uh, in June 2013, The Guardian and The Washington Post started publishing like, very frightening stories about government surveillance. So we found out that the National Security Agency from the United States, you may have heard of it, uh, was being secretly collecting the communication data of millions of American citizens, whether or not they were suspect of any wrongdoing. And it was also having direct access to servers of tech giants, the, 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 the basic, basically all, all, all the, the services we use every day, so Apple, Microsoft, Google, Facebook. And since 2007, I've been collecting emails, videos, photos, file transfers, social networking details of their users, which means us all. And it was quite frightening, but it was just the beginning. And in, the, in these two years, Thanks to this man in front of me, we found out that there is a lot more. And uh, thanks to the work of a uh, journalist that had um, his material and worked on this material, we, we know what exactly is the, the purpose of these intelligence agencies, which is, I think, best recapped in, in, in Grand Gable's No Place to Hide, which is his latest book. Uh, and there is a slide which, in which, he public, in which uh, the NSA says, collect it all, process it all, exploit it all, partner it all, sniff it all, and that's ultimately and more chillingly know it all. So it means that, you know, this is not just a US thing, this is a thing that uh, matters to us all. It's really important to, to understand what, what are the contents of, of, this, uh, of this scandal, which can be said maybe the scandal of the century. And, and there are a lot of things that we can say, you know, we can say that if you, we, we learn that if you play a Angry Birds or if you play World of Warcraft, you may have been subject to surveillance. If you had video chat on Yahoo and famously, as John Oliver said, you know, even if you're changing in, exchanging dick pics, you know, and uh, uh, also, also those pics were passed around uh, in, within the NSA. 
and, and that's kind of scary too. And uh, if you're a WikiLeaks supporter, if you're an anonymous supporter, if you're an activist, if you're a dissident of some sort, you may target of surveillance. So this is kind of scary. Uh, I'm, I'm, going, I'm skipping through like very quickly because I know that Laura Poitras has not much time. So uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Adba ladies first, as we say. And uh, we shall start with, with Laura. And uh, with, hello, Laura, Laura Poitras, I think you all know her. She's um, a filmmaker and journalist, and the last movie just happened to have won like Academy Award at the last, at the latest Oscar um, um, Academy Awards um, in 2015, exactly. Um, and so, um, uh, this this award can have serious implications, maybe, uh, for uh, how we perceive this this scandal and and how the public opinion perceives this scandal. So, the first thing I'd like to to ask to Laura. And I'm going straight to the point since there is a lot to say. Um, I know, Laura, that you, you suffered severe surveillance measures in like the last 10 years. And uh, since we, you were started filming like the war on terror and narrating the war on terror and related issues. Uh, so do you think the, this award will change uh, your life, the way you live and the way you travel and, and work? You know, I mean, I do think it changes certain things. I mean, it certainly makes it more high profile. It means more people will know about the story. Um, it means it's a little bit harder for me to travel um, under the radar, which I was able to do for a long time before. Um, and they also, you know, of course, it does make it, um, uh, it, it provides protection for the journalism that I've been doing, that Glenn has been doing, to have the recognition. But I think that, you know, the recognition we've received before also did that. So the, the journalism prizes that, that have been given uh, for this reporting. So there was definitely a time right after Hong Kong where I think we were both much more nervous. Both Glenn and I um, were advised by our lawyers to avoid traveling to the US immediately after we started reporting and when, after we came back from Hong Kong. I was based in Berlin at that point. I'd already relocated there because I'd been stopped at the US border so many times and I needed to edit without um, worrying about my, my source material being taken. So I'd already been um, relocated to Berlin. And then, of course, we know that, that Glenn is based in Rio. So, but we, both of us stayed outside of the United States for the first 10 months um, when we first started doing the reporting. And I think that the inter international reaction to the stories provides, um, you know, probably provided the real protection in, during the time where things were the most risky. Do you think this... Um this award will change the way, the way in which the, the, the scandal will be perceived by the public opinion too. You think there is, no. because in Italy no. we're about to screen it, you know, for example, and in Italy there has been no, basically no debate, no public debate about it. Just some, on the, in the press, of course, you know, some, some point, but we don't really, we haven't, we haven't really understood what's the, the true meaning of this. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, my work. I mean, I've been reporting on on the on the on the documents um, that that Ed disclosed for a long time. But really, I mean, I consider myself a filmmaker, so this is my way to talk about these issues, and it hopefully gets at some um, other deeper, you know, uh, fears, concerns, broader things like what are the how do these particular programs that have been reported really pose a threat to democracy and all of our democracies. Um, and, and, and to communicate that. It's also very much a film about journalism. It's a film that also shows the attack that we've seen on whistleblowers and sources in the United States. Um, Ed's not the only um, whistleblower in the film. It also features William Binney, who worked for the NSA for over three decades and was put under investigation and treated really horribly by, by our government. So it kind of paints a picture of, you know, what's happening with the surveillance state sort of more broadly. And so, I, and I do think that, you know, movies have a way of reaching people um, in a different, you know, it's a story, people go for that. Um, and so I, I hope it does reach people differently. And I think people, you know, the response that we've gotten, also, I think they understand Ed's motivation a little bit differently because they're in the hotel room with him. I mean, that, about an hour of the film happens in Hong Kong when um, Glenn and I first traveled there to meet him. Okay. Um, in a recent uh, Reddit MA, you said that there's more footage coming from, from the Hong Kong part. Uh, when, when, something more on that, or is it coming? Or Yeah, actually, we're going to be releasing um, some more selects soon. Um, and 
and as a filmmaker, I'll, you know, I'll keep this as, a, as an archive. I mean, the, the material I, I filmed at Hong Kong is pretty extraordinary. The first day that I was there, um, Glenn conducted a lengthy interview with Ed. It was about four or five hours, and I filmed all of that. And, and I mean, it's a pretty incredible historical document. And one of the things about being a filmmaker, you have to make these really tough choices because you only have about two, you know, 90 minutes or two hours and you, so you have to lose a lot of things. So, um, so there's more material from, from you know, the, the, what I filmed in Hong Kong and then other, beyond that, um, actually other people that I'd spent a lot of time filming with. So I'm, I'm working on releasing more of that. Oh yeah, sure. Just to Laura and Ed, we're in a beautiful old church that has terrible acoustics. Uh, and your voices are coming through the internet and their simultaneous translation. So if you could speak just a little bit more slowly, I think it would be easier for everybody. Thanks, thanks, Ben. But by the way, I was so excited I didn't even introduce my guests here. So um, <laughs> Simon Davis on my, on my uh, what is that, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> used to, he spoke about surveillance in the last 25 years or more, and uh, he would talk about his new project. Um, uh, right uh, after uh, when we've introduced with the panelists and uh, Ben Weisner, I think uh, you know him, is a lawyer for the uh, ACLU, which is a pretty important uh, rights, uh, civil rights uh, move, uh, de defendants, I think, yeah, um, on the, in, in the United States. And of course, they're the defendants of Edward Snowden. And uh, on, on my left is Andrea Menapace of the SEAL, the Coalition for Italian Human Rights and Liberties, uh, for, um, for Digital Human Rights and Liberties. And uh, so, uh, Laura, um, there is another thing that, that struck me in, in, a, in a recent, um, in a, in a, in a recent uh, profile of yours. You said uh, mass surveillance is a business plan and it will be difficult to dismantle because it represents a huge market. And, and I think this. This sentence is pretty obscure for non-surveillance you know, surveillance, uh, addicted, but uh, I think it, has, it is really, really important. It is the heart of the matter to me, uh, in, in, in the sense that how can uh, credit can be the, the, the companies that, that were implied you know, and were uh, allied with the NSA, we can say, and with the, the Five Eyes in, uh, in having all the data collected, now that the scandal has, has come, they, they, they finally in, in suddenly un, um, discovered that it was terrible, you know, and, and then privacy is value, and privacy too became, became a market. Uh, if, you can, if you just think about all the, 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 the NSA proofs, proof uh, products that have been placed on the market in the last couple of years. So can you really explain what this sentence means and why it is so important? Well, I mean, the, you know, the surveillance that the NSA does and that other intelligence agencies and the Five Eyes does is enabled by their partnerships with different telecoms um, and, and also um, service providers, internet service providers. So it's, it's that relationship that they rely upon to either cooperate where they ask them to hand over information. A lot of times that's more with the telecoms or they're also stealing information. It's sort of a range of things. And so they're definitely, you know, using that relationship and, and um, to, to collect our data. And I think that, though I do think that it's something that we've seen um, some, uh, the tele, uh, particularly the internet companies step away from in, in light of some of the reporting, they understand that their customers don't, when they, you know, communicate um, with their email providers, don't intend that information to be handed over to the government. So I think we're seeing a bit of tension right now between, in, in, with some companies. Others have been more cooperative. I see. Okay. okay. Uh, should we introduce Ed too? Yeah, okay. Okay, so Ed, um, I'll, I'll start with something about my country. Uh, since, you know, nobody actually no, none of our leaders uh, face this issue. And uh, I, I was thinking, I think I asked Matteo Renzi, our prime minister, like a hundred times what he thought about what you, uh, what you revealed. He never said a single word. Um, not to me, at least, but I think never. Uh, is, is, uh, form, the former PM, Enrico Letta, said nothing. But yet, you know, the, the thing is that what, you, what, what, was in the, what, what was in your archive, in the archive you, you, you leaked, 
it's quite revealing, actually. It is 46 million metadata collected in just two weeks, in December 2012, I think. Yeah. And uh, there is also the British counterpart, the CHQ, that tapped the, f the fiber optic cables that, through which the connection flows, and, and uh, in, especially in Mazzara del Vallo, in Sicily, and the other uh, nodes. And uh, this is, and, and, and also possibly, um, there is the, the li very likely possibility that the PM, our own pi PM uh, was being spied upon, uh, spied on. And so, why, can you explain, like, very briefly, why, what does it mean first for Italy, the position in which Italy, th that Italy has within this scandal, and why this matters to Italians too? You know, why Italians are, should be concerned about this? This is a very uh, complicated question. It requires a lot of nuance to get uh, at specific levels. But when we speak broadly about what is the relationship between the Italian government uh, and the United States government, uh, when we bound that specifically about spy agencies and their cooperation, uh, it's no secret that they work together and they work together quite closely. Uh, there was, of course, the famous uh, rendition case in Italy where the CIA uh, unlawfully rendered someone from uh, who was in Italy uh, to a third country where they were tortured and mistreated. Um, and, uh, you know, the, these things extend far beyond simple human intelligence. Uh, it, it's not well known, um, but when I worked uh, for the CIA in Geneva, uh, I worked throughout Europe at many different places, one of which was Milan. Sono spacciamente non parlo italiano. But um, the issue is that changes in technology have shaped the way we spy on people. And we no longer target people specifically where you have to have done something wrong uh, to have had your communications intercepted. The way these systems are structured today uh, is that regardless of local law, uh, national law, international law, um, the priorities of intelligence agencies uh, that have been unregulated, not very well overseen, is that they've put an infrastructure in place that monitors everyone all of the time, regardless of whether or not you're suspected of any criminal activity. So that just in case you come to the intention of authorities or they'd like to have the authority, the capability, the power to scrutinize you a little closer, whether that's about uh, your politics, whether they consider them to be radical or extreme, uh, whether you are actually a criminal, uh, or whether you're somebody who simply made the wrong phone call or happened to uh, be on the wrong bus with the wrong person, uh, there, is, there are private records being created about your private life that you have no control over, uh, you've been denied awareness of, and yet your governments are very culpable in building these relationships, sharing this intelligence between uh, governments. So when we talk about uh, you know, what is the relationship and the relationship is robust. It's secret. The prime minister may not know the specific details about how things have been shared, at least prior to 2013, because they would not want to know. Now, in the wake of a large scandal, I would assume that they know quite a bit about what's happened. And they should be more responsive to questions, because when they are not, it raises a serious concern for civil society about what are we not being told. We know this is the reality of technology today. And regardless of what the policy of our government is, what the position they claim is, the reality is if even if our country has wonderful laws, wonderful protections, other countries are targeting us with these programs. And if we are sharing information with them or not sharing information with them, we need to think about how we secure the internet, how we secure our private lives, how we enforce our human rights not just through you know, the letters on a page of some law, but through the technologies that are built into our systems that we rely on every day. How we uh, build this into the fabric of our social connections, into our, our, our national values, and make sure that we can increase sort of the domain of liberty, not just within our own cities, our own states, but within the world. And the only way we can do that is by having a dialogue that spreads throughout society that reaches all levels of politics and actually demands responses and accountability from the most powerful members yeah. of our government. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The point, the point being that the government has not been transparent at all. The, the only thing they did is like they, they had some, um, the, the, it's called COPASER, I think it's the authority that um, manages to control somehow the intelligence uh, matters. 
but it was uh, also even what they said is, is classified, so we can't really know what, what's been going on. I had conflicting reports about what, 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 what even they said in these meetings. So, uh, I, how can we try and push to, to put them, uh, to, make, to, to force them to be transparent in this? And is, is, it, is, it, is it a thing of civil society, of journalism? Uh, journalism is one of the most effective levers we still have, and I would argue in some ways one of the only levers that we still have, uh, because it's really a contest uh, for availability of information. The government, uh, not just in Italy and the United States, every country sort of around the world, is never going to reform itself. You know, it's never going to give up powers that it's sort of wandered into or that it's claimed or that it's grabbed. Uh, that's not the nature of power. That's not the nature of government. Uh, so when they have this sort of robust, complete control of information, the only way we can get back uh, is by competing for it. And that's what journalists do. They say, hey, look, the government is keeping secrets uh, here in this case that it is contrary to the public interest to withhold. So yes, they can try to develop sources. Yes, they can provide secure means for officials in government who have seen criminal activity, who have seen serious wrongdoing, or who have seen things that simply seem unethical to come forward and report them. But the, beyond that, we need to keep in mind that governments uh, ultimately are not going to want to play fair. They're not gonna want to uh, put themselves on the same level of members of society. So you ask, you know, what can we do? How can we fix that? And that's a very difficult question to ask because we are completely outclassed uh, in, in terms of uh, physical resistance, of course, they have all the guns and the tanks and the planes and the, the massive surveillance. Uh, we have our, our, our electric cars and uh, our iPhones. Um, but we don't need violent resistance to make a difference. Civil resistance can make a difference. Um, simply in the way we vote, the way we communicate, the way we present ourselves online, the fact that we don't close ourselves off uh, and say, I'm afraid of ending up on a list but to stand openly and brazenly and say, I'm going to live freely and openly uh, and honestly with the people around me. Um, and not because I don't fear your surveillance, because it's rational to fear the surveillance, uh, but because you're making a political statement. And beyond that, uh, to, to realize that the government can say, this is lawful, this is legal. You know, we, we, we wrote something on a page somewhere that said, we have access to all of your private communications. We know what happens in your bedroom because we can hack web cameras. Uh, the GCHQ, the British intelligence uh, agency, by the way, it was reported in The Guardian, that they already have a program that does that. It intercepts the private webcam chats happening from, you know, your, your laptops, your iPhones, things like that. Uh, so they have pictures of people within the four walls of their home, a very private space. Uh, and these programs uh, at the time were not authorized by law. They didn't have any public oversight. But even if they did, even if they passed a law and said that was OK, is that moral? Is that ethical? Should we allow that or should we resist it? We need to recognize that there are points uh, in everyone's life, in every, every sort of arc of history, where governments, following sort of the natural tendency of power to expand and, and gather more authority, uh, that they overstep, that they cross boundaries. And when they cross that boundary, the only people who can stop that are us, our citizens, our ordinary people who say, if you pass these, these, these sort of uh, blank checks for the government to do whatever they want, and they start to change the very nature of what it means, they're doing it even person. more, more they're and more, you know. That, that's, that's one thing they're doing. And in Europe, we're witnessing after Charlie Hebdo, you know, a, a, a lot of countries reacted in exactly the opposite way as the, the debate was going before this, 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 what, this, this happened. So I, I was, I'm thinking of the law, the, the intelligence powers law that is being passing through, rushing, rushed through the parliament in France, for example, and we just had a, a pass through the Senate in Italy, also an anti-terrorism bill that has blacklists in, for website, for jihadist websites and uh, metadata retention for like two e years, I think two years or more, which is uh, being just ruled unconstitutional by the, the, the European Court of Justice. So wh how do you explain the fact that we're reacting with more surveillance and not less? Because politically, these politicians believe it's safe. Uh, they feel that they have to do something and therefore anything is okay. Uh, they, they feel like the worst possibility is for them to do nothing. Uh, but this is, this is problematic because 
we know mass surveillance is not effective. Even within the United States, which has the most advanced system of mass surveillance, which affects the most lives around the world, uh, the president uh, of the United States appointed two pens that had complete access to classified information. Uh, they were staffed by White House insiders, the exact people who would want to say these programs are amazingly effective, you know, to, to basically say not guilty. Um, but what we found was amazing was they said, after looking at all of the classified information, after interviewing all the officials of the National Security Agency, these programs had never made a concrete difference in a single terrorist investigation. They had never stopped a single terrorist attack, uh, is, is what they said. And so we have to ask ourselves, if they're passing laws that cost us liberties, but do not increase our safety, that's even worse. But ultimately, we can't forget that even if they did make us safe by some margin, uh, it doesn't matter if we are perfectly safe, if we are not at all free. And so we have to be cognizant of that line, and we have to sort of defend that as best we can. You can but even, in France... Yeah, and you can a, even be perfectly safe, you know, that's the, even another thing. You can be per perfectly safe, even if you just pass the, even the most draconian law ever. You can, be, you can prevent you some, what happened in Charlie Hebdo, for, in, in Paris, I mean. How can you prevent that? Right. And so this is, this is the exact thing. Uh, what's most tragic uh, about sort of the passage of these French laws um, is that last year, Mass surveillance was legalized in France prior to the Charlie Hebdo attacks, and yet it did not stop the attacks. And we've seen this pattern happen again and again in every country around the world. Canada has mass surveillance. The United States has mass surveillance. Australia has mass surveillance. And despite the presence of these programs, they all, uh, they all had terrorist incidents occur that were performed by individuals who were already known to the intelligence services. They had already identified these people. And yet, despite the fact that they knew their names, they knew their activities, they knew their associates, they knew their connections, and they knew they were radicals, mass surveillance didn't stop them, but it still cost us freedom. Yeah. And yet they're trying to implement algorithms that detect, uh, that's, that they detect patterns of behavior and algorithms themselves define what is a suspect. Uh, is it new in these mass surveillance uh, laws or infrastructures, or is it something that you can find somewhere else? Uh, so this is sort of a, a novel approach. Uh, what governments argue in defense of these programs, they say they don't violate, violate your privacy because they say uh, we haven't actually violated your right to privacy, even though we've intercepted all your communications, even though we've put them in our secret agencies, and even though we can go through them at will, until we actually look through them, we haven't done anything to you. It's, it's totally fine. But... What they don't tell you is that computers, as you say, are already analyzing these algorithmically. And how that works is they could create what are called selectors. Um, these are things that uniquely identify your behaviors on the internet. They could be your phone number, your credit card number. Uh, they could be a certain network of associates. They could be a, uh, a certain uh, sequence of websites that you search online, uh, you check your news first, then you check your email, you do this, that, and the other. It could go to any level of complexity or non-complexity uh, that they want because just like programming, uh, the only real limitation there is, is imagination and the amount of processing power you can throw it at, uh, throw it at the problem. Um, but the result is today, without any human looking at it whatsoever, you can be flagged in a database. Uh, your communications can pop up in front of an analyst despite the fact that you've never done anything wrong, despite the fact that you're not a criminal. Um, and this is dangerous because even if these programs are carefully being used today, uh, they're being used in appropriate and responsible ways, even if we believe that, uh, the fact of the matter is what that represents is the largest system for oppression in the history of mankind. It has been built and set in place in many countries around the world. And the only thing that's required for it to turn against us is for one change in government, where the new head of government says, through a secret policy, which the public won't even be aware of, we're going to turn the key in this system. And now, rather than looking outside of our nation, it's going to look inside. And we won't have the ability to stop it anymore. It changes the balance of power between the citizen and the state so much that we can no longer meaningfully resist or coordinate or protest the policies of a government that has gone out of our control. There's one last question for Laura. I know that she has no time left. So uh, since we're at the Journalism Festival, I think that 
One thing that clearly emerges in, from Citizen Four that is relevant for, for us here is that it's also a, a story about the relationship between a journalist and the source, and one which is essentially made about is essentially made of trust. It's essentially about building trust with each other. And and the the good fact, the good thing is that it's still possible to build trust. I think between the journalist and the source, even in the age of mass surveillance. So, Laura, uh, since we're here at the Journalism Festival, can you give us some hints about how to best do it? How do you build trust with the source when everything is collected? Well, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, this story was obviously not an easy one to report because of the, you know, the topic of surveillance and having to keep the source safe. Um, in this case, I guess um, Ed was fortunate in the sense that I had already had a lot of skills in terms of protecting um, my material. I had a lot of encryption skills by the time he emailed me. So, um, so I know I knew what he was talking about when he said when he asked for my public key, when he asked me to use Tor or get on a different operating system that was more secure. And I think that a lot of journalists, that's one of the lessons that they've had as an outcome of the story: the importance of protecting um, our digital footprints. That our digital footprints tell the world or tell governments, if the governments are paying attention, um, who we talk to, where we go, um, and what we're thinking about. If we, if we just Google a topic and don't use any way to um, anonymize our, our internet traffic, then it's very easy to say, oh, this person is working on, so for instance, drone, um, drone attacks or renditions or, you know, Guantanamo. I mean, all those things become selectors that flag people and that are associated um, with what people are querying on the internet. So I think that one of the big lessons from, from what Ed has disclosed and also this particular story of journalism is the importance of encryption, anonymizing web um, searches for journalists because you really can't, you can say, I can say that I will not in, uh, participate in any investigation if I'm ever questioned about a source. I can say I will protect my source, but if the government can then just contact Google and, um, and, that, and if I don't do anything to protect how I um, uh, use the internet, then a lot of information can be uh, obtained. And we've seen that. I mean, we've seen it in the US context with many journalists. There's a renowned journalist um, and friend of mine, James Risen, who was, uh, the government was trying to compel to testify against the source. And in that case, they were able to obtain some data on him. So I think that that's one of the big lessons that journalists have to learn how to use encryption technologies in order to do their job responsibly. And that's no chance why states are trying to, to ban it. Example, for example, David Cameron, uh, the, the British PM, recently lashed out against encryption. Uh, and from your research also, what you published on, on, the, on the United States Canada, we found a lot of ways in which you know, they try to, but, but, but can they win it? Can they, can they crack encryption? No, I mean, A, no, the encryption is, is uh, they still can't crack the math, so encryption does provide security. But let me just say that we use, everybody in, who uses the internet uses encryption all the time. It's built into the architecture of the internet. Okay. When you do your online banking, you're using encryption. Otherwise, you know, you'd be putting your private information would be at risk. So encryption is used all the time. And it really can't be banned. And as and as of today, the math is strong, and it hasn't been broken. Okay. So, so if I could add on I've, there on a technical point, uh, oh, what Laura oh, said, they can't break the math, is they can't attack it directly. But something that we do see increasingly uh, is that these secret agencies try to steal the keys. They they try to steal. They try to go around encryption by attacking the places the keys are held, where they're generated. And this has actually affected Europe. Uh, we saw the GCHQ and the National Security Agency worked together uh, to hack into the uh, Belgicom, the, the national telecommunications provider of Belgium. Uh, they hacked into a company called Gamalto, which is uh, headquartered in the Netherlands, which provides the keys that are used in the communications for your cell phone that's in your pocket right now. Um, these are the kind of things that are really dangerous, and yet, this is the same argument the governments are now using to try to say, uh, because of terrorism, because of uh, criminals and things like that, because people now are more aware of, uh, of encryption, we want to require companies 
to hand those keys over to the government. Uh, we want to have back doors into everyone's communications. Sometimes they'll say uh, what we really want are front doors uh, because they don't like it being called a back door. It sounds kind of shady. Um, but ultimately, whether they, you call it a front door or a back door, whatever it is, what it means is a way of getting the keys to a communication without having to break through them. The problem with this is if keys are held, they can be stolen. We know this because it's been reported that the NSA and GCHQ do this all day long. And if we build back doors into the systems that are protecting the West's banking information, medical information, critical infrastructure, our power plants, nuclear facilities, our hospitals, our traffic lights, this means our adversaries can now steal them the same way we have been stealing them, uh, we have been stealing these keys from them. Suddenly, we will have you know, the Chinese and every other country in the world uh, able to own the keys to the kingdom in our own societies. No matter where you split these keys, no matter whether you have one key or whether you put them in multiple locations, uh, the people who control these keys can be subverted. They can be recruited through uh, intelligence groups. Uh, you know, that's as old as human society. Uh, they can technically be subverted. Uh, employees can be hired uh, by foreign intelligence agencies and sent into these organizations to take them back. The danger is governments are saying because we face a small threat uh, that communications might be encrypted and they might make, our, uh, might make our investigations a little more difficult, which by the way, uh, the United States government cannot show a single case uh, where that has actually prevented an investigation. Um, they say because of that threat, we're gonna make all of the communications in our society and throughout all of our allies' society, because you know, we tend to share laws, have a fundamental weakness that while it will give us an advantage in surveillance, it undermines our security permanently and fatally. I would like to say thanks to you. Laura. I know she has to leave. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Um, your movie will be screened tomorrow night here. Thank you, guys. Thanks. It's a pleasure. So, Ed, there is one thing I'd like to, to know and understand better from you. Last week, researchers from the Citizen Lab in Toronto published uh, a very interesting paper that I don't really understand uh, about uh, this thing called the Great Canon, which should be a companion of the Great Firewall. For those who are not in, into surveillance, the great, the, the great Firewall is the main tool for censorship in China, and it's one of the most sophisticated, apparently. And the Great Canon, instead, is a hacking tool. And Apparently, it's been used to target GitHub and other sites, and it, it basically redirects, for what I get, um, traffic from websites like Baidu or something and to, to attack other sites which are intended targets of Chinese government, basically. And uh, this reminded a lot of, com of commentators and, uh, said that this reminds of NSA's quantum system. Uh, can you explain what, what this means and, and why this is important? If there are similarities, are, they, are these systems actually similar for what you get? Right, the systems are actually very much the same. And this is not because you know, the Chinese had to sort of copy the NSA. Uh, because what this uh, system is, is, is not black magic. It's not something that's incredibly complex. It is uh, incredibly dangerous and it does require uh, an incredible amount of subversion within the telecommunications companies of your country. Uh, and the NSA did sort of author the book on that. They were doing more um, uh, with less oversight, more aggressively than, than many other countries around the world. But the problem is uh, how this works in, in just the basic uh, way is when you send communications across the internet and they're not protected, they're not encrypted, uh, that crosses many other devices, many other networks, many other companies around the world, sort of like off ramps on the highway uh, to get to their destination. If any one of those off ramps is subverted by an adversary, say uh, the NSA can go into the telecommunications provider and say, keep this little box on our network that'll let us manipulate people's traffic. When it hits that point, they can change the communication. And rather than you getting a copy of facebook.com or your search engine or whatever it was you were intended to get, you get an exact copy of that page with a small malicious payload in it that hacks your computer. Uh, the real problem that happened uh, with this uh, sort of great canon story 
is that it's now happening openly. Governments that used to be doing this in secret are doing it in the open because uh, in the West, when, we, uh, when this was revealed, uh, basically when the newspaper said, uh, we're hacking people who haven't committed any crime, they're just sort of uh, transiting the internet and they came to our attention. Instead of stopping that program, instead of uh, treating it as a scandal, we tried to normalize it. We tried to excuse it. We tried to justify it. Instead of saying, no, this is wrong, this is dangerous, this puts uh, the economy of our country at risk. This puts the private communications, all of our social networks at risk. Uh, it means that people can no longer communicate safely without worrying about who's manipulating their traffic. They tried to legalize it. So many other countries around the world that are much more authoritarian than the United States and, and the United Kingdom and things like that, uh, countries that are much less responsible uh, got much more aggressive because they went, well, if they can do it, we can certainly do it. They've set a precedent that it's now okay to use the internet as a weapon. And what broadly we have seen in the wake of 2013 is an opportunity for society to come together, uh, to create a new, uh, uh, a new norm, a new standard for uh, international uh, behavior, where we say the internet is vital to all nations. Uh, it, it's vital to the way we communicate. It's vital to the way we share. It's vital to the way uh, we trade. This touches every life in, in every country that uh, is operating at a certain level of technology. And for this reason, the internet must never be militarized. But lawmakers have not moved quickly enough. Instead, they've sat on their hands, they've deferred because of fear of terrorism to intelligence agencies. And what's happened is just as we see in the United States, uh, police agencies, law enforcement agencies are becoming more and more militarized. Now, internet service providers are being co-opted in secret by the same sort of policies, the same sort of influence, the same sort of pressure by secret agencies to allow national governments to subvert the internet to their own purposes. What used to be trusted pathways are now unsafe. And what this means is it's not the end of the world. It's not, uh, it is a very dangerous status quo, but it doesn't mean that uh, the game is over. What this means is that we, the only way to prevent the great cannon uh, from basically hacking your system, subverting your communications is to encrypt them. Because when they hit that off ramp on the internet, you know, when your email hits that and they try to change it, if they cannot read it, if they don't know what it's supposed to look like, they can't manipulate it in the same way. Yeah. And if we don't do this now, it will become a much greater problem in three years, in five years, in 10 years yeah. uh, and, than it is today. Uh, and there's respect, one last thing before opening up the discussion to our panelists here. Is there still a clear cut distinction between democracies and authoritarian countries when it comes to mass surveillance, uh, state hacking, not, not just on broader political scale, but on, on, on these topics, is there, is there a clear-cut distinction? Or do you think like the Russian system, the Chinese system, other systems that are in place, uh, very aggressive systems of mass surveillance, are, are they similar or do they share similarities or do they make the same thing? Uh, they're very similar in the fact that we don't know how they're being used. Uh, we don't know who the victims are. Uh, we don't know what the costs are because they're not being reported. Even in the most liberal countries today, there are no measures of efficacy of these systems. Uh, you know, they don't say uh, this helped here, it didn't help here. So we can't, uh, in liberal societies, weigh the costs and the benefits of the programs. In authoritarian societies, these programs operate the same way. They have the same technical capabilities. The difference uh, would be, uh, at least in theory, how they're being applied. Uh, are they being applied for repression? Uh, are they being used to, to sort of slander political enemies? But the, the real danger here is the fact that, while yes, that's very likely true, because uh, we at least do not want to believe uh, that Western governments are abusing these programs in egregious ways. Uh, and there's not a lot of evidence that they are uh, using it for, say, personal political gain and things like that. Um, the problem is that they could, and we would never know about it. Uh, we have no way to oversee these programs and ensure they're being used properly. And there are, in many cases, no criminal penalties for abusing these programs. For example, in the United States at the NSA, uh, there were at least 12 cases where NSA employees 
used these surveillance programs to monitor their spouses, their lovers, their girlfriends, their wives, uh, their husbands and things like that to see if they were unfaithful, just to read their email. Um, and this is a crime, but uh, none of these individuals was brought to court, not a single one of them out of 12. Uh, some of them got fired, some of them got disciplined, some of them got you know a nasty letter written in their employee uh, record, but no one was held to the account of the law. And until we can show that not just low-level actors, but the highest level actors within a country uh, are liable for programs that affect the lives of everyone in the country, uh, we're going to be at a very real risk that even if our intentions are very different than authoritarian governments, than uh, aggressive governments, the actual outcomes, the results of these programs could be exactly the same. Thanks for the moment. I, if, feel free to jump in the conversation, of course, if you want later on. Um, I've tried to open up the conversation here. For, uh, ben, there is a common reply to those who like, like us are worried for the, about the, all has been said right now. And, and it's if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. You know? And that basically is the position that Google's Eric Smith had before the scandal became a scandal. You know? And now he found out that privacy has value. But uh, wh why is that line of argumentation wrong exactly? Because it's such a common reply. This is too big a subject for me. And even after my very excellent answer that I'm going to provide, people are still going to be asking that question all the time. But you know, I like to say that I think that is the wrong answer to the wrong question. Um, it's the wrong answer because everyone in this room has a lot to hide, even if they're not doing anything wrong. Um, we hide all kinds of intimate activities. Um, we close the door when we use the bathroom and the toilet and the shower. We, we don't open our bedrooms to our friends and neighbors. Um, we maintain a sphere of private life where we can be one person with one friend and a very different person with one's mother. Um, you don't have to be a criminal to have something to hide. Um, the reason why I think it's the wrong question is that it suggests that privacy is fundamentally about concealing, um, about the difference between secrecy and disclosure. Um, when in fact I think we've learned, uh, if we haven't, we should, that privacy is about other things. It's about power. It's about context, control, autonomy. Uh, it's about democracy and liberty and free societies. And if we reduce it to this idea uh, that because I post all of this information on Facebook, obviously I don't care about privacy, uh, I think we miss the, the, the ways in which the state accumulating all of this information um, is actually accumulating power. Um, and a world in which um, all of the details of our lives are stored in a surveillance time machine that can be rewound at any moment to recreate them uh, is one that will be much less free. Uh, and even if that's not something that you worry about personally, um, you should be worried about the effect on the broader society because it changes the relationship between citizens and the state in a way that will eventually affect you too. There is also, uh, of course, a, a reform process underway in the U.S. Uh, uh, about the NSA powers and more generally the intelligence, what, what the intelligence agents can, can do. Um, one thing I would like to ask you what is first, what would be a meaningful reform of this, of this system, of the system that we understood is in place right now uh, of the NSA? And, and, uh, and the second thing, maybe, is um, <clears throat> try and, and understand um, I missed it now. I had it in mind right now. Uh, but anyway, yeah, just, just start with you. Yeah, just, just, just. So the question, what would meaningful reform look like? And I think that this is really a question for, for everyone on this panel, and people might have very different answers. I mean, we heard Ed talking about technological reforms that are necessary, um, that we need to uh, protect our data more using encryption, and that will protect people both in free societies and authoritarian societies. Um, but if you ask me as a lawyer, uh, I'll answer as a lawyer, uh, and say that the, the, the major problem is that um, our Constitution in the United States has been turned upside down. Um, ordinarily, the rule should be 
that people are left alone unless the government suspects them of wrongdoing. Uh, and we enshrine this in the Fourth Amendment to our Constitution, which says that the government should not search or seize uh, information about a person unless it has probable cause that they're engaged in some kind of wrongdoing. Uh, and this was a response to a practice of the British royal uh, uh, colonial government where they would seize huge amounts of papers in using general warrants and read through them to figure out who the dissidents were, who the people were who opposed the crown. Um, the NSA is engaged in a digital version of that today. Um, they have decided that they are going to collect everything uh, and that the Fourth Amendment has nothing to say about massive amounts of billions of communications that are stored in a database and that the law only comes into play when an individual conducts a search of that database looking for another individual. Um, with that legal rationale, there's no limit on what governments can collect. Why should they stop with the metadata from our telephone calls? Why shouldn't they have drones flying over our cities at every hour um, using sophisticated cameras to videotape every inch of public space? Um, why shouldn't they put those cameras in our bedrooms, um, which have been known to be crime scenes uh, all too often? Um, why shouldn't they record the content of all of our phone calls in case someone comes under suspicion later so they can listen to those phone calls? By the, by the legal theory that supports the NSA's surveillance, they could do all of those things and the Constitution would be silent. It would have nothing to say about it. So the most important legal reform is for us to get our courts and our Supreme Court um, to say that the, the, the old rule is still the new rule. Um, that suspicion should come before search, not search before suspicion. Uh, we don't get to collect everything and then search through it to see who the wrongdoers are, even if that means uh, that criminals escape. Uh, the people who created our free societies were more worried about a government with that kind of power than they were worried about some criminals escaping. And there's no way to read the Bill of Rights of the American Constitution without understanding that it was written to make government slower and less efficient at crime solving, not faster and more efficient. This is by design. Uh, and so that's the main, the, the, the main legal question. And I will say, uh, and this is a story that I like to tell and Ed thinks I tell too much, uh, but in the very first conversation that we had, um, one of his first questions for me was, do you now have legal standing to go into court to bring these lawsuits? Because he had watched as all of our lawsuits against the NSA had been thrown out by the courts. And the courts said, you have no right to be here because you can't prove that these programs affect you. But you can't prove that these programs affect you because that's a state secret. And therefore, goodbye and go home. Uh, and, and that was the system that everyone says that he should have gone through and not around. That's the system that we tried to go through for a decade before uh, he brought the public into the conversation. Uh, the very first document published by The Guardian showed that the NSA was collecting the ACLU's phone records because it was collecting the phone records of all Verizon business customers. And that same week, we were in federal court with a lawsuit. And yes, we do have standing. Uh, and, and we do expect that we'll reverse this legal regime. One, one last thing on this. Um, it's a question for you and for Ed, of course. Do you see hope in presidential candidates and in, in respect to the surveillance, to, to surveillance reform? Of course, the one we have now. You want to go first? I I would say that uh, the thing I'm most concerned about with presidential candidates right now is the fact that their private communications are electronically naked. Uh, we have a secret service uh, who will follow around candidates and offer them physical protection uh, from somebody who might try to, uh, you know, shoot them in a crowd or something like that. But when they're developing strategies, when they're talking about how they'll campaign, when they talk about who their allies are, uh, who their significant donors are, what their pain points are, what their fears and weaknesses are, adversaries around the world can see all of this information just as easily as the National Security Agency and everyone, every other bad actor and hacker in the world can because we don't provide them with an electronic secret service. More fundamentally, our society lacks an electronic secret service. 
We have this agency in the United States called the National Security Agency, but it's acting much more fundamentally like a national surveillance agency. And I think that's the most fundamental problem. So I work for a nonpartisan organization that does not endorse or support candidates, but I will say this. Um, there have been a few very remarkable developments. So we saw a Republican candidate for president in his speech announcing that he was running for president devote two paragraphs to criticizing NSA mass surveillance and saying that the people who were Ed's bosses at the NSA should be punished for shredding the Constitution and breaking the law. Uh, I don't think he'll be president. I think it's still a remarkable development that this idea was introduced into an American presidential campaign. We've seen other things. We saw uh, in the first summer of the revelations, uh, there was a vote in the House of Representatives in Congress to defund, to take the money away from NSA domestic surveillance. Um, 200 of the 430 members of Congress voted for that bill. 100 were Democrats, 100 were Republicans. So this is an issue where both parties are weak and both parties are strong, depending on where you, you find it. So, so I think that we're seeing the beginning of uh, anti-surveillance politics. We're seeing it more in the US at the local level than at the national level. Um, we're seeing it more in the West than the East. We're seeing it maybe more in libertarian circles than in liberal circles, but it's coming. Um, you know, in the meantime, um, we can't wait for our parliaments, we can't wait for our Congress, we can't wait for a president to come and rescue us from this mess that they all created. Uh, there are things we do in, in, in the interim, we file lawsuits and try to engage the courts, uh, and we, if we're technologists, we build tools. Um, if we're citizens, we push our governments and the technology companies to offer us more protection. There's a lot to do, um, but, but I don't see um, uh, any likelihood that this problem is going to be solved by politicians. So I'm coming to Andrea. Um, as we said, this debate is not only about privacy, it is about, it is a fundamental right nonetheless, and it's important to remind that, and it should be respected, but the debate we want and we should have is larger, and involves like civil liberties in general. Can you explain to us why it's so important to have right, right now in Italy somebody who defends this kind of concept? Yeah, thanks for the, for the question, Fabio. I think it's extremely important for a country like Italy to start talking seriously about civil liberties. ACLU is 80 years old or more. Liberty in the UK is 80 years old. In Italy, <clears throat> we are the first multi-issue organization when it, it comes to civil liberties. So there is a reason for this, uh, this situation. So I think we are ready to engage with an informed and much more honest debate on civil liberties because we are a coalition because we cover m many civil liberties. And we don't know yet if we, our political leadership is ready to have the same kind of debate. I think our leadership is still to realize the importance of civil liberties in general, let alone civil liberties in the digital space. To us, the internet is the fundam a fundamental part of the civic space. It's not something in the air. It's not something in the net. It's part of our lives, and, that, and that's why we need to care about it. Yeah. And we just witnessed in the anti-terrorism bill that they tried to sneak into an amendment, like um, a passage in which they say, basically said, okay, wait, and, and we can remotely control your, your PCs, like that, you know? And apparently, it, it, they, they meant to, they meant to insert to legalize like uh, state Trojans, basically state malware, and uh, it has been rejected uh, for for now. Uh, but the, the government is going to be is going to be presenting it again, uh, maybe in an amend, amended fashion in um, in the in the next White Top bill, I think. And uh, why is it possible that these things happen? I, I mean, it's it's a gigantic thing. It's it's incredible. It's incredible that in two two sentences, like two phrases two lines and then you have like these huge developments 
And no, no one takes uh, responsibility for that. You know, we don't even know who wrote it. it they just say, no, it wasn't me. Alfano said, no, it wasn't me. Um, Renzi said, oh, I stopped it. Okay, but maybe you should, it should have come up in the first place, you know? So uh, are you going to monitor all this stuff too? And are you going to be uh, active on this, uh, on trying to educate also politicians that this thing, you can do that, of course, you know, but it's, you need to take a political stand. You know, you need to, to, to be transparent to people and to your citizens to say, okay, we, we want state malware to be regulated, okay? Shall we discuss about it or shall we put just in, inside an amendment, which is just crazy to me, you know? And w would, you, would you monitor that too? Yeah, definitely. That's the, the main reason why we exist and why we grow from 13 organizations six months ago and now we are 13 organizations. So I think that Edward Snowden put it in the best way when he said the government in itself is not going to reform itself. Sure. And if any political leaders, no matter the political views, is not a challenge in a free society, nothing will change. So it's not an easy, it's an easy journey, but it's a journey that is worth taking. So if you think that if we don't challenge the government, if you don't speak to the power, we are not going to improve our society at all. And if, especially in, in this, the lack of debate in Italy about the Snowden revelation, the privacy and mass surveillance, the perception is that if you don't challenge the power and the power do not feel like compelled to tell something to their citizens about this situation, and we are still waiting for our prime minister to say something about that, you make people think that you live you have a mass survey society, which is a strong society against your enemies, but a mass survey society is a, a weaker society, it's not a stronger society. It's a society that pretends to protect their citizen while making their citizen weaker and much more vulnerable. And that's why what we do, norm what any civil liberties organization around the world normally do is just to try to do advocacy because there is information. Yeah. In Italy, we need to like, make a step back to make two steps forward. So we do three things, main, mainly as a coalition. We connect organization and people who cares about civil liberties. We inform people and we advocate. We need to inform people because in this country, I'm sorry to say that, but sometimes journalism and the media are not doing their job properly. Yeah. Exactly. Absolutely agree on that, by the way. <laughs> uh, so, Simon, this is a very difficult situation we're in, you know, and you've been monitoring and finding surveillance for, for a lot of time now. Um, how has it changed in respect to where you started first? Um, and what can we do about it? Wow, that's a, I know. That's a big I question. Know. A big question for a big guest, you know. <laughs> um, okay, so I started nearly 30 years ago. We started raising the issue of, for example, Echelon, uh, which is one of the NSA's uh, better known programs back in 97, where the media advised me to get some medication because clearly that was a conspiracy theory. Um, and we went, uh, our biggest challenge right throughout those decades was how do you inspire the public to become active? As Ed mentioned, you know, civil resistance, civil, the, the, the community standing up is what is necessary and standing up for the future history of this, pl this planet and of d democracy. Now, we've had a huge problem uh, getting people motivated. If we were talking about secret spy chips in uh, garbage bins put there by the local authority, you can get people rioting on the street. But this is such a huge question that it's almost like its size makes it invisible in the imaginations of people. So this is a, a very, very tough question for us. Well, so I'm going to, uh, Ed, I'm going to ask for your advice on something here, on that question. At one o'clock tomorrow here at the festival, Annie Machon, the former MI5 agent turned whistleblower, who you probably know, and I are going to launch an initiative called Code Red, which involves people like William Binney, and Bruce Schneier, and a, 
uh, with Diffie and a lot of the grandfathers of this movement. And we want to take this to the next level. So we've got the, the best campaigners in the world, the best technologists. And if you had that resource, what would you do with it? The, the world's greatest thinkers, the world's greatest pioneers. What would you do with that resource? <laughs> That's a really hard question to answer on the spot, but I would say I tend to look at things from an engineer's perspective because that's my background. So when we see the system and, and where these sort of um, problems have arisen, uh, where the leaks in sort of the ship of democracy have started to occur, we have to think about the incentives because what is a government? A government is comprised of individuals. How does a government make its decisions? How does it work? You know, what uh, drives it? What controls it? What makes a government more likely to be responsible than irresponsible? And I think if you look at that, you know, what is the difference between the worst governments on earth and the, the, uh, the best is that in the countries where the government acts most responsibly, they have the strongest uh, cultures of holding themselves to account, of self-policing, of when somebody does something wrong, uh, they're punished, they're controlled, or even if the government officials aren't, the government fears its public. It fears the citizens rising up. It fears them rioting in the streets. It fears uh, electoral backlash uh, because it knows that it can't simply control the media. It can't control what's on the TV channels. Uh, it can't just sweep it under the rug. How do we prevent the development of technology, the, the great escalation uh, of, of power we've seen around the world, which is really technology is a, a amplifier of power. If an individual uh, magnifies their power, yes, they're more capable, but they have a very small amount of power to begin with. If a government which has a great amount of power amplifies it by the same factor, the distance between them becomes greater. Uh, so how do we do this? How do we ensure that we as people, as the public, as citizens retain control of our governments? How do we make sure we're incentivizing them to be more responsible? And I think this is really what the privacy right is all about. The privacy right is the right to be left alone. We talk about privacy, but what we really mean is liberty, the right to be free from judgment, to develop our own thoughts, to decide our own activities, to discover our friends, to coordinate and campaign, and maybe run for office, maybe run against someone running for office. When we allow mass surveillance to take root, when we allow these systems to take place, we're fundamentally changing that relationship between the governing and those they govern. And I think if we could address that with campaigners, with activists, with technologists, the fastest and most, uh, most successful way to do this is to prong. You assert what the rights are of citizens around the world, what we've lost and what we should have, you know, the rights we inherited that we want uh, our descendants to inherit the same way. And then two, how we are going to enforce those rights, regardless of what uh, sort of the local policy in this jurisdiction or that jurisdiction is, because this is a natural right. This is a human right that regardless of what somebody says, some official behind closed doors decides are the liberties we should enjoy. These are the liberties that we are willing to stand up and defend. Thank you. I got just one last question, and it's about basically what uh, John, Oliver's, John Oliver said to you, Edward. Um, it's the communication issue we have. It's all good, you know, and it's all right. And it's all very difficult. That's the problem. Uh, do you think that is there, there is some other way somehow to try and communicate beyond going for the for the dick pics, you know, um, bit, which is funny, but I think it's fundamentally wrong because there's much more than that. Um, what can we do? I think one of the simplest ways to do it, uh, which would of course never be allowed. Uh, would be to invite news anchors, uh, politicians, political figures, prone activists, even ordinary citizens, uh, somebody to go into these secret agencies and search for their own names. See what comes up when they enter their own phone number, their own credit card, their own email. And the fact that, you know, I sitting at my desk in Hawaii could read the email of basically anyone in the audience who uses a common service because 
to you or to the United States, you're all foreign nationals. You have no rights whatsoever. But also the fact that the same sort of context applied for uh, US citizens, uh, simply with a little bit more procedure process layered over it, is horrifying. If you're sitting in this room right now and you have a cell phone in your pocket, your government knows where you are. So do other governments. So do criminal actors. So do sophisticated hackers who have broke into those telecommunications providers. Um, think about what would happen if people had access to your email who didn't like you, uh, who could reveal sort of uh, the private story of your life, even things that you don't know about yourself. From the metadata of your communications, the government can tell when you wake up, when you go to sleep, who you call, how frequently you call, uh, what your relationship with these people are. Do these two phones spend the night together? Does one of those phones also spend the night with a different cell phone on occasion? Uh, but it's, it can also be much more simple than that. It doesn't have to be uh, you know, the fact that we're afraid because we've done something wrong. It's the fact that the government has all of the information it needs to judge you completely. And the people who are looking at this information, the people who are analyzing this information, people who are trained as NSA analysts like myself, all day long, they're hunting for bad guys, uh, you know, hackers, terrorists, political radicals, and things like that. When you have that background, you know, humans are pattern recognizing machines. When every day you look at ordinary phone records and you see hints of terrorism, hints of subversion, hints of criminality, and then you look at a normal person's phone records uh, who really uh, have never done anything wrong. Let's assume they're an angel, they're Muslim, Mother Teresa, they're the Pope. If I looked at the Pope's phone records and I am an, uh, a terrorism analyst, I'm very likely to see a terrorist. And this is the danger. When you have enough records about ordinary people, people who have done no wrong, you can find wrong within them. And fundamentally, that's a power that we should not grant to government because once they become acclimated to it, we can never revoke it. I'm out of questions. Um, I think we ran out of time. I, I just don't know how you cannot pardon this guy if you're Mr. Obama, you know. But anyways, that's my opinion. So I think uh, we should thank Edward Snowden. And thank you all for the patience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.